Okay, so um, you will notice that there is a new tab, Assignments, and you, most of you already know this because you're doing the uh, cloud course and Christopher is using exactly the same setup. So what will happen is um, we will have all the reviews done in the merge requests on a GitLab, but we have to assign people to do the uh, reviews. And also we have to keep track of who did and who didn't do the reviews. And then the reviewed people will be able to review the reviews. They will able to tell, oh yeah, that review was helpful because of blah, blah, blah. And this review was not helpful because of blah, blah, blah. So there is like a review both ways, right? And to manage that, like GitLab doesn't support that. Like GitLab doesn't support me to tell who should uh, review whom. So we kind of need to do this system thing, right? So in the system, you will kind of, uh, you already registered probably in the system, in the submission system uh, that Christopher is using for the cloud. There will be a PROC 206 course and there will be like the assignment one. And then, you know, before the deadline, you go there, you fill up a small form where you paste uh, your um, uh, URL and then the URL will reveal who you are. So then the reviewers, like we cannot make it totally like, you know, um, anonymous. So the reviewers will go to your repo, will kind of do the merge request review by giving you comments. And then they will go back and say, yeah, I've done it, right? And then you will be able to give them comments on the reviews. Uh, so it is non, not really a anonymous system, <laughs> uh, but I hope it, it will work uh, anyway, right? That you kind of talk with each other and you kind of give yourself each other some suggestions. Um, so that's uh, about the assignment. Any questions about this? We never done this this way, uh, that we mix the code review with the merge requests and the system. We always were doing reviews with the system alone. There was a form and everybody had to fill up the form. But I think doing the reviews actually in GitLab is better because that's what you will do later in life. You will be reviewing other people code in the companies that you work in Git, uh, in GitLab or GitHub. Uh, the process will not be anonymous <laughs> and you will have to give kind of reasonable feedback. So it, it kind of simulates like what will happen at work later, right? Um, and we only use the system for managing the logistics, like who is assigned to whom and who is doing what, right? So the system will kind of keep track of who didn't got the reviews yet, and they will kind of dynamically assign uh, people to do reviews for people who don't have reviews yet and so on. So the system does that. Um, we did that uh, for a couple of years. Uh, before that, we've used like a spreadsheet, which was a nightmare. Um, the system is not perfect, but at least like logistic wise, it, it should work. So we will see how it goes. Okay, uh, so no questions about this. Probably there will be questions later um, when you actually start submitting. You can submit the URL and the, the, the repo like before you make it um, internal and then you're done with the submission. So you can do it way ahead of time because you're still committing to your repo and so on, right? So. You only have to do merge request before the deadline. This thing, the submission thing, you can do way ahead because it doesn't um, require any sort of any extra work, like the work you'll be doing with Git. Um, okay, so that's that part. Uh, let me see what else uh, we have for today. So today we will do um, two things. The first thing is we will talk a little bit about the mouse. So let me go, it's not tutorial one, but so we spent some time doing the um, lab six and I can see there is a, a large number of um, uh, attempts, which is really good. Um, I've only reviewed uh, Oyston and myself uh, two days ago. Uh, because the other ones were not present yet. So I will talk a little bit about mine and I will do the rest uh, after the class, of course. So the way to work with this is you can, of course, go to um, so if we go rock 2006, what was that? Uh, lab 6. 
So then if you say uh, git branch all, you will see all the branches which are there. And then you can go to a, a, a specific, uh, specific branch and then you can test uh, what, what people were doing, right? Uh, some um, merge requests are with the branch which is not in this repo, which is in the branch of the person's workspace. You can also do that in, in GitLab. Uh, but the ones which are here, uh, you can kind of do, uh, you can test uh, by switching the uh, the branch, right? So if I, I switch the branch, um, if I switch to check out, Oyston, um, and then I go to lab six, and then if I go, I up. Um, so also uh, uh, one note about the versions. So as I told you on uh, on Discord, uh, I'm I switched consistently to version uh, nine to seven, and nine to seven is like across all the examples and all the things that I'm doing right now. Okay. Uh, it has one small issue, which is that the uh, Haskell language server seems not to support 2.7 yet. It supports 2.6, uh, but you know it's a minor version, so it should be should have no impact on the actual language itself. Uh, but if you want to use 2.6, yeah, fine. But then you ha will have to change one thing. So if you fetch a project which is using the 2.7 9.27. 9 uh, you will have to go to stack.yaml and then in stack.yaml there is the resolver uh, and the resolver is currently 2013 for 2927 but if you want to 6 you use, you use 12 right um, what is this all about well there are two um, two systems to manage dependencies one system to manage dependencies is automatic and Kabbal is using the automatic one and it, it is based on the assumption that the algorithm can work out what version to use for your software, right? So in the perfect world, libraries will have dependencies and then the version dependencies will kind of match such that the resolver can find uh, dependencies will kind of solve this uh, you know, um, dependency problem. The other approach says, no, we tried that and it will never worked. <laughs> there always needs to be a human who says, yeah, this can work with this and so on, right? So stack is using the human options. So in stack, uh, they have those lists of the packages with certain versions, which depend on other versions and they will always compile. They will always work. Um, whereas if you're using Kabbal, it kind of tries to match all the versions dynamically and sometimes it fails. It actually fails a lot of times. Uh, because you have circular dependencies and then the versions like don't are not specified properly and sometimes you have to use older version for this but younger version for that and then you have a conflict and then the resolver doesn't know what to use so if you're using stack you have to tell stack which kind of package uh versions you want to use and there as i said like um there are two later ones uh 2012 is using GHC 9 to 6, and that's the one we've used before. And then if you upgrade to 13, you will be using uh, 9 to 7, and you will be using the uh, the package versions, which are a little bit younger, right? Um, for this course, it doesn't matter. So you can happily use 12, but because I switched to 13, my examples are 13. So And I don't want to maintain multiple versions of, of uh, GHC. I'm changing it to 13, right? So I will change it to 13. And then if you're using um, if you're using stack nine to six, you just keep it 12 and then it will use your uh, GHC uh, to nine to six. And then you can do stack uh, run and then you can try out uh, the various um, uh, various examples. If you change the version, it will have to do what it's doing now, which is it has to compile everything as afresh because you are changing the versions of all the dependencies, right? So it takes a while. Um, and it may or may not be annoying, but to me it is annoying. Like I, I always uh, don't want to uh, spend time. So I kind of try to stick to nine to six, the nine to seven, and kind of use all the pre-built packages that I have. 
Um, yesterday evening, I cleaned up all my caches and everything. So it will have to rebuild everything anyway, because I deleted everything, right? Uh, and as I told you in, uh, in Discord, uh, Haskell is quite bulky. So you can free up, you know, 20, 30 gigabytes of space if you do this cleanup, if you kind of uh, clean everything. So where everything is? Well, in, in, uh, in my case, if you do uh, which stack, it will tell you where stack is. And then you can go to GHC up. Um, so I will kind of do the, yeah, it's actually, yeah, let me show you. It's in um, user local seller. And then if you go there, you will have, um, no, it's, um, yeah, let's try. HC up. Mm, there are some caches here which I cleaned up. Uh, there are versions of GHC which the GHC app maintains for me, and I actually do have both uh, six and seven. Uh, and then there is uh, so you can delete the ones which you don't want from here. Uh, and there is a language server. I'm, I'm using the latest one, uh, but as I said, it doesn't support two seven yet. Um, and there is a stack, um, yeah, so it is in, in my case, it's in homebrew. Uh, and then if you go to seller, then you will have stack. So CD Haskell stack. Oh, come on. Is it called stack? No. Yeah, so somewhere you will have um, stuck. Um, uh, no. I was pretty sure it's in cellar. But what is it called? I thought it's called Haskell stack, but it's missing from here. Maybe I, I, yeah, I don't remember. Maybe I removed it. In any case, yeah, so let's check again which stack. GC up. So stuck, let's see where it points to. Yeah, it seems I don't have a uh, isolated stack in, um, installation anymore. So if you do have a stack installation, then in the stack home folder, you will have a subfolder called programs. And then you will have all the um, versions that you can clean up as well. So those are a couple of places where you can um, uh, clean your your storage. Okay, so here I kind of run the example um, which um, Oyston pr produced and he has quite a nice working version of the uh, drag and drop. So you can drag um, the, um, the stones and notice that the point where I'm, I'm start dragging it, it's, it's very nice. Like, so when, when I click on it, it remembers exactly the like the coordinates of where I picked it, and then you kind of are dragging it kind of nicely from from that from that point, right? So if I go check out to my one, yeah, because I did some modifications, I have to stash them, uh, and then I will go to myself and then stack run my my implementation so my implementation is slightly different i prepared it a little bit more towards the assignment so i have sort of a board uh, and then i have two stones which you can drag so if you start dragging it you can drag it into the board and you can grab the the white one and so on notice that my one is kind of crappier 
because if I click on a stone, it detects that I clicked on the stone, but then it uses the my mouse pointer as a upper left corner of the rendering image for the stone. So my dragging is kind of a kind of a little bit crap, right? Um, because I don't do what the previous example did. I, I'm kind of doing it in a more uh, naive way, right? So you can move the stones. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, the stones you're kind of creating, right? So initially the board was empty and now I, I kind of have stones. So I'm kind of generating new stones and putting them somewhere and then remembering where, the, where I drop them such that I kind of refresh uh, every frame, like where, where they are. Uh, and in my case, you cannot uh, you cannot drag existing stones. You can only drag those two stones, which are for players to make moves. Uh, so yeah, it's slightly different reading of the requirements, right? Uh, and slightly different implementation. And I also changed the, the background a little bit. And now I would like to draw the lines, like the grid, and only be able to drop the stones on the grid, right? So I will not remember the absolute positions of where the stones are, but where they are on the on the grid, and then I will redraw them depending of um, where the uh, image is. So also, like I will close that and run it again. So also notice that I have a rescalable window, so I can rescale the window, and then it tries to keep the board as a square and tries to put those two stones uh, in appropriate place in relate in relation to the uh, to the board. So I can make it smaller, and then again the board becomes a square, and then the two stones are here, right? Um, so and then again this works. I can uh, drag them and place them somewhere, right? Um, because the the currently I don't have the grid, and I'm not putting the stones on the grid itself. Scaling after you you move your stones doesn't work. So if I kind of move move this you can see that the stones are kind of in a wrong position. They are not relative to the board. They are kind of uh, absolute positions on the board. So that's something I, I have to fix. Okay, so how have we achieved that? Uh, you, can, you can browse the code and you can read the comments. Uh, in general, um, let me see. In general, um, come on. There is some mouse. Um, issue here, yeah. So, in general, um, SDL works as a um, uh, system where you have um, in-game or in-system events, you're converting them to some intents, and then you converting the intents to a world state change, where you're converting a world from previous state to the new state. And then you have a rendering loop. So we've done it for the for number of laps already. Like we, you had some examples of how to do that. And now we have a little bit more complex situation where we need to handle the mouse uh, coordinates and mouse movements and clicking of the buttons. And we also need to um, maintain the world, which is a little bit more complex, right? So in my case, um, I have. Um, added a couple of uh, intents. So one intent is to handle the change of the window size. So if the user drags the window edge, there is a window uh, resized events which are generated. And from those events, you can get the new size of the window. So every time the, the user uh, re like uh, drags the size of the window, you get those events. So I have to handle them. So then I have an intent for it. Then you have the mouse being moved. So if the mouse is moving, you get events and then you have two coordinates of where the mouse is currently. And then you have the button, uh, button pressed or button released. Uh, of course, the mouse button pressed and released also generate of where exactly the mouse was at the time. So you can get the coordinates from those events too. But because I already know where the mouse is, uh, because I'm handling this one and I'm storing the X and Y in the world, I don't need to handle uh, those two coordinates separately. Um, you know, which way is better? It, it kind of depends like how you organize your code and how, how you're doing it. You can do it the way um, uh, other st students did it, like by handling the coordinates here, or you can do it the way I'm doing it by, by handling the coordinates here and reusing them. Um, 
using the world state. Um, yeah, this is probably easier if I show it here. Uh, so, so um, if we if we keep them in the uh, so I have the the mouse position actually stored in my world state. Um, and I don't like it that much uh, because it's sort of like a global variable which I'm passing around everywhere and it, not everybody needs to know it, right? Uh, so it, it feels the code kind of smells a little bit because you probably should have that contextualized. So Oyston, for example, he has it contextualized in the event and then the functions which handle the event handle that. Um, but yeah, I was planning that because I need to have the grid on the board and I, when the mouse moves over a particular intersection, I want to, to do something. I need to know where the mouse is all the time, right? Uh, so maybe I do need to have the, um, the position of the mouse all the time in the, in the state of the world. Okay, the second question is how to handle textures. Uh, in this particular assignment that we're doing, we only really have three textures. Maybe if you fancy, you may have a little bit more, but you need a texture for your white stones, for black stones, and for the background. You may even not do the background. You may just color the background with a color, right? So you only need two textures, like minimum. You, Of course, you can have more, but the minimum is two. So for two textures, it's a little bit of an overkill to build like a special uh, subsystem for handling with textures. So again, I stuff them into the word state, right? I have the texture for background, I have a texture for black and white stones in the world, and then I'm passing world to the renderer and the renderer can fetch that, right? We had this discussion of loading the texture and unloading it every frame, that's a bad practice. So here I'm loading the textures once, put them into the state of the world, I'm using it every frame, and then at the end of the game, I'm, I'm releasing it, right? So. Yeah, I think it's not too bad. Like uh, if I had more textures, polluting all the textures here in the world would be kind of uh, not nice, but with three textures, it's acceptable. Uh, at least I, I thought it, it's fine. And then you have this kind of um, initial word definition. So it kind of populates some initial values. Of course, you can redefine it later. Um, if you do have something which is undefined and then you try to use it, you'll have a runtime exception, right? So the program will blow up, right? So if I know I should never have a situation where I have uh, something undefined, uh, I can initialize it to undefined because later programmatically um, I make sure that it's not undefined. Um, so I kind of often do that uh, because I don't want to have a default here which then sneaks in undetected that I didn't initialize something, right? So for some things, um, picking a default, it's kind of fine. Like for example, I have window dimensions, which are kind of uh, non-existing, right? It's zero, zero. I should as well say undefined here because if I didn't define the window dimensions yet, then the program should crash. Like I, I should have, you should eliminate all the programming errors that you're doing and eliminating all the programming errors, it's good to have defaults which make the program crash if you haven't pro programmed properly, right? Okay, so then you can kind of uh, check the, the rest of the code. Uh, the important thing is um, the events uh, which are being converted into intents and then intents which are being converted into the change of the world, right? Uh, so this pattern is what SDL tool encourages. And of course you don't have to do it this way, but it is the model which kind of works well if you follow that pattern, right? Um, so then you will see that we have, um, we have uh, um, conversions from the actual events, SDL events to the intents, right? So there is a function which converts events to intents. Uh, and then for all the possible events that, that we can handle, that we want to handle, we have a particular intent. And then we have a conversion which goes from the intent to the words change. And you could do this by having functions which take two arguments. 
that take the intent, the world, and then create a new world, right? But we tend not to do that. We tend to decouple it such that we have intents not taking the world. You see, like the apply intent is a carry which takes only one argument and the second argument is missing, right? So the second argument is passed to this function, which is here after the e equal sign. And those functions are the ones which actually do the world change. And the nice thing about that is that those functions have world into world, right? Um, why we do that this way? Because it's a bit more modular. Uh, a particular word to word function can be invoked by multiple intents. And then you want it to be isolated in the separate function, which is kind of a word to word. So it's, it's a much nicer and a much better design than doing that right away here, right? So we kind of have a, a layer of inter um, a decoupling. Uh, and then those functions are super nice because they are always word to word. So you're given a word and then you're producing a new word. Um, and then those functions sometimes take arguments. Uh, so for example, here, when the mouse is moved, this function takes a new position of the mouse, existing word, and expects a new word, right? And that's where I'm updating my mouse position inside the word. Um, so about the syntax also, there is a kind of a nice uh, syntax in Haskell where you can take a, a record type and you can have a copy of it with some fields changed. And you just say which fields are changed and then all the other fields are copied from uh, from W, right? So the word is a record, a record type like a struct. And then we passing it here as an argument. And then we making a copy, exactly the same copy of everything apart from that one field, which now has a position, right? Uh, in Rust, if you got to this point in Rust, uh, you have to do it by saying three dots. So you have to say, this record is the same as this record and copy all the other fields by doing those three dots. In Haskell, it copies everything by default, right? Um, so if you don't do it in Rust, then the default is that all the other fields are not initialized, only that one which you have here is initialized. In Haskell, it's the other way around. Like if you want the other fields to be undefined, you have to say, I'm creating a new um, instance. So you'd use a type constructor here and then you would have just this one field initialized and then everything else would, wouldn't be initialized, right? Okay, so then you kind of go on with the, um, with the um, implementations. Um, one thing that um, I, I was uh, thinking of, um, yeah, I, I I will explain it maybe the other uh, the other way, uh, other time. So um, usually we do this uh, body with the where, uh, and this is kind of nice uh, because you have all the definitions of the kind of a variables that you need, kind of a pattern matched here, and then you kind of using the logic here, and the logic is usually quite concise. In in the rendering case. I could decouple it, like I'm currently drawing multiple things. So I'm drawing the background color, I'm drawing the board, then I'm drawing those two stones which are used for dragging. Then I have to draw, draw, um, draw all the stones which I've already dragged and dropped. And then uh, I have to drag, I have to draw the, the stone which is being dragged, right? So I'm doing quite a lot. And I probably should decouple it into individual methods such that I kind of see clearly what's going on. Um, if those are just one liners or two liners, the comment and the body is kind of okay, but this will become kind of a more complex. So then having methods and met uh, functions and function names tidies up that code more. So then the render world becomes kind of a more clearer to follow, right? Um, Okay, if you're doing something like this, always put some comment, like what is this for? Like, what is this for? Uh, if you have a function, then the function name kind of tells this metadata, right? So then it is clearer. Okay, so that's about this. Um, I will quit that. And about professionalism. So if you go into the commits, you will see that I have six commits and you will see that I have them organized quite nicely as I was progressing with the implementation, right? So I have the initial structure, initial kind of um, 
data types and all the things that I needed. Then I added some intents and intent handlers. Then I started doing the actual drag and drop. Um, and then I added the stones which were used for drag and drop. And then I changed, when I was reviewing Oyston code, I found like a nice uh, trick so I changed like two lines of code into a single line of code uh, because I felt it is nicer and I, and I refactor it even further, right? So um, all the refactoring and all the logic is here and that kind of demonstrates like a progression through your project, right? If you have one giant commit, yeah, that's very unprofessional, right? If you have thousand commits, yeah, that's too much also. Like uh, you should commit into kind of a logical blocks such that it's easy to cherry pick later and to see what was happening. So like pay attention to that. Okay, uh, any questions? I know you will have to spend some time actually uh, going through the merge requests yourself and kind of checking how people did that if you didn't do it yourself. Uh, yeah. Can you take a look at mine? It's the one at the top, Cecilia. Okay, this one. Okay, so what is your problem? Yeah. Yeah. Here. Um, no. No, I haven't seen that. Um, it might have to do with, um, can it be my STL image input on my header file or something? I did it slightly different than you, right? Yes. Yeah. It seems that the problem is some, like, you know, you're trying to print something to the screen. Um, did you add it? Did you add any print lines or standard things? No, to... So it's a clean, uh, clean pool from the project. Yes. Yeah, and I pulled it again on this piece here, right here. And yeah. Then... Right. So let me see. That was lab six. Yeah. So uh, okay. check out main. Let me quickly check. Uh, so normally, um, yeah, you 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 running it with Cabal, right? Yes. So normally, it's a good kind of practice to purge and clean everything, just in case you have some stale caches. Uh, in my case, I just say run. What I want to check is when it runs, if it prints anything here. Yeah, it does. You see, it asks what is your name. Uh, so what I suggest is um, because on Windows. Um, uh, for some reason, they like Microsoft thought if you're running a Windows application which is using Windows, you will not have a terminal. And then if it's a terminal application, you will not have a window. So they did kind of decouple the terminal applications from the GUI applications. And then if you try to mix a GUI application with a terminal which prints something to standard output, it causes issues. And my hint, my hunch is because it says, Standard output, age put char invalid kind of file descriptor. So the program compiled, the program is running and the program tries to print something to standard output and the standard output doesn't exist. Like there is no standard output to print into and that's why you're getting this error. So my suggestion is you just remove any printouts or standard uh, or a put string line from the code such that you don't print anything to the terminal, you just have a window opened, right? Um, because this is a window application and it has the SDL image and SDL main. Uh, so it tries to kind of do a window application, even though the, the skeleton doesn't do anything actually. Um, and that might be causing the problem, right? So if you remove that, it probably will work. You, you get the idea? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so let's do some, uh, if you have questions like that or if you have problems like that, yeah, make them into the issue tracker. Um, so the thing that we will do today is we will um, 
do some practical work, uh, but the first warm up practical work is again Camila's uh, tutorial one. So let me just go there. So all I want to for you to check is if you go to labs and if you go to tutorial one, uh, if we go to merge requests and then if we go to her uh, merge request, there is Cecilia. Cecilia yeah, sorry, sorry, Cecilia. Yes, uh, apologies. Um, so to uh, Cecilia's um, uh, the yeah this one the very first one, so we have a main, and we're doing a couple of things. So we're printing a prompt, we're getting a line, we calling uh, her sum with the map read words on the line. And then we're printing the result. So the task is to do it in one line without the do. So how can we do all those four lines without the do in a single line? To make life easier, I, I said, don't do this final uh, final thing here. So as you see, put string line takes a concatenation between the show and the summed numbers, which we get here. Uh, but then if we have to do this additional concatenation, it kind of complicates unnecessarily, right? So we're not doing the final concatenation. And put string line already adds end of line character anyway, at least one, so it should be fine, right? So try to do this in a single line of code without this final thing here. Poc. <laughs> so I will um So if you have it, uh, just wave your hand and say we have it, and then we will kind of do it. For simplicity's sake, I will redefine my sum as being just a sum. So I will not define it using the zip or whatever uh, Cecilia was doing it. Is it Cecilia? Yeah, good. <laughs> uh, and we just do this, right? But the rest is the same. So all the other functions we will already have in the in uh, GHCI. So we can do it in GHCI.
So some hints, you may need to use brackets. You will need to use the um, function composition. You may, you will need to use a bind. And you probably will not have to use that operator. So you probably only need those three. Of course, you will have to use all the functions. So concatenate and all those, but. You've done it. Okay, there, there is one more hint. You will probably use need to use the sequence also, sequence operator. So how, how is the progress? Where, where are you on the progress bar? 20%, 50%? Okay. 20%? <laughs> so everyone will have slightly different approach, um, but you kind of need to get a feel of what things like how things compose, right? So the, the first thing is to observe that we have to print something 
and then do something else and print something else after, right? So the, the first, like, uh, you can, of course, tackle it in different order, but let, let's uh, follow my, my train of thought. So when I'm looking at it, I, I see, okay, I need to print something, then I need to do something, and then I need to print something else, okay? So I need to um, put string line, something, some, and then I need to print something else. So I need to do two things, two printouts in a single line. So to do that, I will use the sequence, right? So that will, um, that should do two things and do the first thing and then do the second thing, right? So, and it does that, right? Um, so I already kind of uh, tackled the, the sequence thing. So we can remove this and we have some else. Okay, so then I need to make the second thing a little bit more complicated because I need to pass a parameter. So I need to show something here. So I need to kind of concatenate, right? So I'm kind of, um, I have my program, but uh, so the first thing is uh, right numbers, right? And then the second thing needs to be not just to print uh, the string, but to combine it with um, uh, something that I will concatenate it with, right? So then I need to kind of uh, tackle the, the, the printing and concatenation, right? So I need to print something which combines the concatenation and that, so sum, some prefix. So here we say, we say sum is, and then this, like this is a carry, which expects one argument. So I have to pass, uh, I have to pass something to it, right? Uh, otherwise it will not work. And this carry expects a string, right? So I have to pass a string to it. So I can say, okay, uh, take uh, some. So then I have problems. Um, so I need to decipher what my problems are. So my problems are, that put string line is applied to too many arguments uh, because right so So let's check if this one is correct. So check if I have, um, if I because what I want to achieve is I want to achieve a carry, which is the concatenate, right? So is that correct? No, it's not. So we have some problems with with this. Um, we could. Try doing ticks, and that also is not correct. So, how can I make maybe I do that? That's not correct, neither. So, how can I make a carry with concatenate and the, the first argument already there? Any ideas? So 
Well, it seems to be correct. It's just the interpreter was like throwing some random errors saying, oh, I don't know what you're doing, but if we define an F to be our concatenation, it seems to work fine. So then if I call it with uh, mama, it says, you know, it puts uh, mama on the left-hand side and uses uh, sum on the right-hand side. So that seems to work. Uh, it doesn't do exactly what we want because we want uh, sort of something like this, right? Some, so let's try that. Brilliant, we cracked that, right? So now we have a curry and the curry takes one argument and so on. So if we go back to our, okay, so here it kind of worked, but the curry was sort of this way. Okay, whoops. Let's do this. Plus plus. So that works. Let's don't deal with the um, with this for now. And we test it, and it works. Right? It does what we thought it will do. So we have a function now, which puts something on the screen and then puts a prefix and concatenates it with the argument that we pass to it, right? So this thing is a function which expects one argument, right? Um, and this function which expects one argument prints something to the screen um, and this argument we just feed in here just for testing. Of course, this argument is actually a number, right? So if we do this, it will blow up because we haven't converted the number to a string. So we have to convert the argument of for this concatenation to a string. And we do that with show, right? So now we have to do show first. So we convert 34 to string, then pass this string to this carry and then pass it to print line. Let's test it. All right, we're getting somewhere, right? So we have done a little bit of the of this. So we putting something on the screen, we solve the show and we solve this concatenation thing. Yeah, so what's what's left? I mean, now what's left is to do this sum, right? Uh, the sum on a string, right? Uh, because words, takes a string at the end of the day and does all those things. So let's recall our... Okay, so now we have this working, but instead of passing 34, we want to do even more dots, right? So we have to do a sum. Okay, so we have to do a sum. We have to map uh, read on words which are passed to us as a string. Okay, so let's test this. Whoa, it worked in the first go. Okay, fantastic. So we have this whole thing in one line. We only missing, we need to pass this string to it, right? Because we fed it with the dummy testing string and now we need the real one and the real one comes from get line, right? So now, I mean, you could try to say, yeah, 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 it works great. Let's do get line. But that will not work, right? Why it will not work? Because, yeah? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because get line doesn't give us a string. Get line give us IO string, right? So we have to kind of get inside, like inside the IO structure. So this would work if getLine gives us a string. That would work. But getLine doesn't give us a string. It gives us IO string. So with that, we have to do a little bit of a trick because we have to say, okay, we have to get this IO string first. GetLine we get first. And then we use the bind with all this thing here because bind takes a monadic value, which now we have this IO string value and feeds it into a function, 
which converts a normal value, which in our case is string, into an I.O. action, which is the put string line is doing at the end of the day, right? So if we try that and I say one, two, three, the sum is six. Whoa, we almost cracked it. So now we have it. We only need to have this initial prompt, right? So we have to say, uh, put string line, give me numbers, and then do that. Give me numbers, one, two, three, four. The sum is 10. It is hard. I'm not saying it's easy, right? But once you get used to reading the code like this, and once you get used to um, like following like this, I also said like, uh, you can write code like this. You can call, you can do this, right? So if I say my sum, uh, yeah, this is, uh, let me, let, let me just double check if we have my sum. Yes, we do. So if I, if I say my sum, I can say it like this and then I pass it, I need to pass it a string. So in fact, I can pass it like one, two, three string, right? And this will work. Um, but compared to this line where we use dots everywhere and we say this, uh, my sum, yeah, we should say my sum. You see that the, those two codes are a little bit different. Like this one is using dots everywhere and this one is not using any single dot. It's using the dollar. So I suggest you don't write code like that because then it's a little bit harder to be reading this more complex code. What you can do is you can convert all those to dots um, and they are the same, right? Because now we have a function, a single function which takes one argument. If we do this, we have argument, which is fed into this function, which is then computing it and fed as an argument to this function, which is then computing it and feeding it as an input to this function. So we sort of kind of doing three steps where in fact, we should be doing just one step, which is, um, which is just this. And this is a single step because this is a single function. It's just one function, which takes one argument, right? Uh, mentally, like conceptually, because compiler will work it out. Like for compilers, they are both the same, right? But you reading it, you kind of need to decompose it like uh, into three, uh, three things. Here is just two things. It's an argument and the, the function, right? Can I pass, so if I have this like this, can I pass get line to it? Uh, can I do this? Will this work? No, it will not work. Why it will not work? Yes, it is the IO problem again. So this is a monadic value, which is IO string. This needs to be a function which takes something, a string, and producing a monadic value. It doesn't have to be IO of string, but it has to be IO of something. And this one is not producing IO, right? So this will not work. If you try it, it will say, no, no, you know, it's not working because... Um, you are not having the right hand side correctly. Um, so uh, you do need to convert, the error message here is complete uh, nonsense for you, right? The compiler would probably give you a correct answer, correct error message. This error message is not helpful, but you know it's not working because you're missing IO. So if you say print, then it will work because, uh, so it's reading the numbers and then printing them, because print takes the, whatever this produced, which is a string, and then, uh, actually this is a number, 
and then it prints, converts it to um, um, to a string and then do an output into the screen. So print, if, if I rewrite it, like it's exactly the same as doing show and then put string line on top of that, right? So instead of doing put string line show, you can just say print. So again, one, two, three, and six. Okay, um, let's do something more fun. So let's go into the tutorial two. Uh, so if we go back to labs and go to tutorial two, we're doing uh, some trivial things with students. So you have to define a student type and it has to have ID, name, surname, and age. ID and age can be ints and name and surname can be strings or text. Why would we make them text instead of string? We would make them text because text processing in Haskell is so much faster than string processing. String is a kind of a very um, old fashioned data structure, uh, which is basically a array of characters. It's a list of characters, you know, um, so the string, string, oh, come on. String in Haskell is exactly the same as this type, right? And that representing a string as a list is kind of inefficient. Um, so text, um, data text is not, it's not, um, array of characters. It's actually a, like a blob. It's a, it's a blob of text. It's a blob of string of uh, characters. So it's much more efficient, but you cannot say like head then, right? You can say head on a list, but you cannot say head on a text. So you have to use the API, which kind of allows you to do certain things and doesn't allow you other things. So if you want to optimize it, you will convert string to text. But when you're doing a proof of concept, if you're kind of just implementing your first implementation, you're not refactoring it yet, use string because you know you don't care about performance for that step. So write a student type, which has those properties. How would you do that in Haskell? Uh, this exercise, I really encourage you to do at home in Rust as well. Um, but for today, we're doing it in Haskell. So define a student type. How would you do that? I will uh, do the same uh, in the repo. By the way, clone the repo and kind of modify the lib file of the repo itself, right? Uh, because then when you do merge requests, it will nicely omit all the other files that you might have in your project because you will be only modifying one, one file. And then the merge request is much cleaner and much tidier. And that's how it would work if you are actually doing it in a, in a company. So I will do the same. I will go to program tutorial two, git pull all. I will create a branch, which I already did. Um, and then I will um, set my branch Marius to be Marius. Yeah, it uh, doesn't exist upstream because I haven't pushed my code yet, uh, which is fine. I haven't done anything yet, so. So
Bucks. So have you done it? That should be pretty straightforward with the exception of the syntax, right? So Rust syntax, Go, Go syntax, and Haskell syntax is slightly different. And then you just need to refresh yourself, your memory of what the syntax is like. All right, um, let's have a look. So that's my, my implementation. It's as vanilla as you can get. You probably should uh, put a comment if you were to pay attention to professionalism. Represents, uh... yeah, but it's kind of self-explanatory. Um, no tests for this. Okay, why are we deriving show? So we can print it, like uh, I can uh, instantiate a student and then print the instance of it. Uh, why are we deriving equality such that, for example, if I have a set of students, I don't have duplicates or I can compare if this student is the same as the other one, right? Because if I have two students with the same ID, with the same name, surname and age, they will be different. They will be two separate if I don't have equality. Is the equality deriving correct? Um, yeah, probably not, because semantically what we want is a student if I have two students and the ID is the same, it is the same student, right? So then I have to deal with data inconsistency. For example, if I have the same student with the same ID and different name, like that as illegal state in the program, right? So then you have to balance like how you're gonna manage that, how you're gonna manage that the ID needs to be unique and you should not have two students with the same ID. So you either derive equality or you define your own equality type class and say equality is if two students have the same ID, they are the same student, right? And then you may end up with two instances with the same ID, but different names. And the, if you check is, uh, you know, Alice equal to Bob. And if they have the same ID, the system will say yes, but obviously Alice and Bob have different names. So then you have data inconsistency, right? Mm -hmm. um, for simplicity's sake, I just said, okay, if they have the same ID, there are two different students because Alice and Bob have different names. So the equality check will say they are different and I have the ID collision problem, right? Because I may end up having two students with different names and an age, but they have the same ID. And then I have the ID collision, right? So with this choice, I'm saying I will deal with the ID collisions. I will not deal with the data inconsistency, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, next step. So next step is implement an initial version of new student function, which takes a string and produces a maybe student and produces nothing on an error. So what we want is we want a function which does something like this. Um, so uh, con creates a new student if the data is correct. Okay, so what this function will do. So we will say new student and we will pass it a string. 
and the string will be in a form of ID. So like one and then followed by name, let's say Bob, and then followed by surname, let's say Marley, and then followed by H, I don't know, 23. And then we expect um, a new student. So we expect the student, uh, which will have um, ID equals to one, uh, name equals to Bob, and then uh, surname equals to Marley, and then age equals to 23. And if the data is in is correct, it will just get just student. But if we say, if we say new, yeah, so let's do this. If we say new student, for example, one, uh, 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 and then, and then SSSA, obviously the SSSA is not a number. So SSSA will throw us a problem and then we cannot create a student with the invalid age. So it will create nothing, right? So we, we kind of producing a function or implementing a function which should pass uh, those tests. And it's the function is called new student. It takes a string and produces maybe student. String S. So this exercise is about error handling and about like simple um, simple behaviors. Um, so we need to have a function which will convert string to maybe student. And then if there are errors, the user supplied us with the wrong data, then we produce nothing. If you did this, if you say, I have a function which uh, takes a string and produces a student, what is the problem with that declaration? Yeah, the problem is that you need to deal with the incorrect data, right? Um, so one naive way of dealing with incorrect data is to use a default value for age. So if someone enters the invalid data, you say, well, you know, we assume the person is uh, 23. Uh, making assumptions like that is, is always a bad idea, right? So if someone supplied you a wrong data, you should tell the person that the data is wrong, right? So you, you have uh, multiple choices. One choice is you use defaults. The defaults is most of the time a wrong choice. So it, it, it is out. The second option is you can blow. Right, so you can crash the program. So if our read reads uh, CCC, it says oh, yeah, it's not a number, and it stops. Right, but crashing a program because of user input, that's also a bad idea. You should never crash your program through user input. You should tell the user that the input is wrong, but the program should not crash. So that's also a bad idea. So now the third option is, yeah, we cannot have the signature like that. Right. So the third option is, yeah, if we have a problem we produce nothing. The program will not crash. We got nothing and we can tell the user your data was wrong, right? So that's what we're doing now. We kind of, uh, we are able to tell the user your input data is wrong. You, your student, which you want us to create, has something wrong with the data. We are not telling the user what is wrong yet, right? So this implementation is a simpler error handling. We will do the better one next. So the simple one is we just produce nothing. So how we would do that? Well, you do your one. I will try my one. Um, so mm. 
All right. How is it going? Did you implement the function? I have some initial attempts. Uh, and it kind of the compiler complains that I have parameters like ID, name, surname, and age, which I'm redefining or shadowing the functions which I have defined here, which is like a ID, name, surname, and age. And that's fair enough. And that's the first lesson to learn that if you have your structs, the naming conventions kind of matter. And usually what you should do is to have some sort of a naming convention such that you, um, because those become functions on top of your record type. So I usually kind of uh, prefix them with the constructor. So I say student ID, student name, uh, student surname, and then student age. And then I that then those names will not conflict. And those are kind of more natural as variables, right? So hopefully that will make the compiler happier. Um, of course, now we have the the problem of ID because ID is a function, is an identity function in, in, in Haskell. So I have, I will call it um, student, I, uh, student ID, and then I will use student ID here. Okay. So now it will build hopefully without a problem. Uh, defined but not used. Okay, so uh, fine. What is the problem with my current implementation? Well, the problem is that if I read something that is not, um, that is not, um, um, a number, it will blow. So student, new student. Okay. So then we um can do a little bit stack test. So we tried and it uh it didn't work because um the for Bob Marley the output is I you have to be quite specific about the, you know, spaces and all that nonsense. So the, the, the thing is kind of incorrect. So what I will do is I will copy the correct one. Uh, into our test. So this one was incorrect. And it should be like that. Perfect. So then uh, let's try it again. And then it will blow because for the incorrect ones, uh, it throws an exception, right? So it, it is not doing what we expect. We expect nothing. And it's kind of um, trying to read this SSA setting here uh, in that line of code. And then it throws an exception. So that is not what we want. We want, um, you know, we want not to throw exceptions. So we need to read maybe. So we need to read maybe. And then we cannot pass um, sit because sit is uh, maybe int, um, not an int. So we have to kind of a sneak in the constructor type, uh, our type constructor to use maybe values, right? Um, so then the code, this code needs to be redone. Okay, so we need to redo this. Did anyone did the, the function as intended? Did you do it? Okay, did you push the merge request? Okay, but uh, what time is it? Yeah, it's at 10 already. So we stop here. Uh, we come back to it a little bit on Monday. Uh, so we kind of uh, finish the initial implementation with maybe on Monday uh, before the class, uh, before, before the lecture. lecture. 
uh, and then we redo it with either. So may, uh, maybe types and either types are really great types for error handling and for uh, using in your assignment one implementations such that you know what went wrong. Maybe it's probably in assignment one, a very useful type. Uh, it's not so important what or where the error is because the problem domain is such nice that it kind of renders itself very easy to nothingness. Um, but for assignment two, you will have to use either. Um, so yeah, we kind of uh, wrap it up on uh, on Monday. Oh yeah, thanks, Alf. Uh, so Alf hinted me what the, because I had some typos uh, in the implementation, I was using the wrong um, uh, here, yeah. So syntax, if you're doing kind of multiple things like in Rust and Golang and Haskell, the syntax is kind of, uh, yeah, biting your ass sometimes. So of course this is in most languages, but in Haskell it's this. Um, okay, thanks. Thanks, Alf. See you guys.